I don't get to say this often, but I'm currently looking at and speaking to a Nobel Prize nominee. Uh, in fact, I think that's the only time I've ever said that. So we're joined by <laughs> Dr. Bart Rodemaker today. First of all, thanks for joining us. We are exploring, and this is a unique conversation, we're exploring how to break this uh, mold of disease-centric symptom masking together. And Bart's been, been doing some amazing work. And I met him actually at the biohacking conference in LA a couple months ago, where he was continuing his research. And what you didn't see a lot of there was sort of allopathic medicine clinicians, right? What you saw was a lot of people that want to take care of themselves, anti-aging, longevity focused. What you didn't see was people like Bart with the deep uh, academic and sort of experiential background uh, who have crossed over and said, there's more to what I can do than what I'm doing. And I'm going to explore outside of my toolkit, which really, to me, is uh, mind-blowing because it's very hard to break that mold. So first of all, thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much. It's an honor for me, Cash. So, you know, when we met there, we did a little interview because you have your radio show. It's been going on for seven years. The regenerative and uh, reconstructive industry kind of looks to you as a thought leader and follows the work you do. And so I was honored to speak to you about that. Uh, and now we're honored to be potentially working with you, you know, Absolutely. to bring this to the greater world. So tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing until now. It's like I've been did a little bit of injustice other than the fact that you're a nominee for such a prestigious award. Well, I've been a plastic and reconstructive surgeon for the last 25 years. I'm fortunate. I trained in two different continents. So I got an excellent training in that respect. And when I dove into the regenerative side or the, the plastic surgery reconstructive side, I recognized there was a lot more to it. And it's a transformative approach that we can actually begin to look at. And that's how I got into um, understanding that, you know, how do we harness the potential of the body to restore form and function? And so for me, going into regenerative medicine made a lot of sense because you're tapping into the wisdom and the intelligence of our cells into restoring form and function. And then fast forwarding to today, when I'm recognizing that, you know, my path to how to make wellness a must and accessible to all in this country is concluding the fact that, you know, as doctors, we need to rethink how we practice our medicine today. And this is actually why I'm so incredibly honored and excited to be talking to you, because as people and smart people like yourself, outside of medicine that are solving the problems that we're facing today. Yeah, it's challenging because if you're in the industry, you're really got your hands tied because you can't do so. We know clinicians that have lost their licenses for saying right. certain things, for doing certain things that they knew right. were in the best interest of the patient, right. but were not college approved, right? Right now right. we're facing in Canada, Health Canada, our equivalent of the FDA, deciding whether primary care doctors are allowed to recommend supplements or not. Mm -hmm. Vitamin C and D. There's, I don't think there's anything on the planet that has more publications than vitamin D. Right. And they're saying it's not evidence-based. Right. So this is the reality of what we're fighting against. And there's some bold people like you that are out there saying, yeah, I want to make this work. Uh, and yeah, it does take people because you're restricted when you're in the system. Right. So people have to come from the outside and fix it. You know? No, absolutely. So tell us... I know when it comes to regenerative medicine, there's kind of two halves to it. Uh, some people think of it as the sort of uh, not so holistic part, which is, for example, I had a tear in my shoulder and I got a PRP treatment done, right? And it worked, like it worked really well. I also had a tear in my elbow. I pushed a little too hard at the gym sometimes. And so right. both of these things are now fully functioning. But that translates far beyond that into things like, exosomes and stem cells and regenerative medicine is pushing so far ahead. So where is it and where is it going? Well, what's interesting, I think it's important to put in context because there really is so much misinformation out there. And part of the challenge is that we don't have enough clinical trials on the one hand. And then the other hand, people aren't being really quite transparent as to how we are actually managing regenerative medicine. But right. when you think about in the context of this, you know, you have a trauma or you have a, an extreme imbalance of the tissues in your body, you just don't have enough cells or stem cells in your system to be able to address that. 
And so essentially the term that we like to use is we need a surge. We need a surge of stem cells in a particular area to correct the imbalance. And that's what stem cells really do. All they do is really correct. They identify an imbalance because that's what cells can do. They can identify what's going on that's wrong and therefore respond accordingly. And so that's essentially what our stem cells do. And the same thing with exosomes. And so what actually does happen is that there's a delivery of enough of enough growth factors or, or messenger signals to the tissues to then actually respond. And so it's an interesting development because I was one of the first plastic and reconstructive surgeons to begin uh, using stem cells back in 2009. And it was you know, easily accessible then until the FDA shut that down. And that's just an, an entirely different story. Um, but I also knew at that time that uh, technology would soon catch up. And nowadays we have access to either bone marrow stem cells, uh, which is uh, essentially regulated and many practitioners are practicing it right now. We got adipose derived stem cells, which is what I started off with in 2009. It's, it's a brilliant process because we get large numbers of stem cells compared to the bone marrow cells. And so it has that, that efficacy effect. And then of course we have um, allografts. So these are derived from the umbilical cord. And again, the FDA is in a quandary right now as far as you know what they're allowing and what they're disallowing. Um, but the truth is, is that this is what I call intelligent medicine, as well as the stuff that you do, by the way, that's intelligent medicine too. Um, and it, it will come that um, it will be much more accessible. And the most important thing is it's, it's very safe. Um, we just don't know ultimately, you know, how patients will specifically benefit from stem cells. And that's where the FDA comes in as well. And, and, and in a fair way as well, by saying that we can't make claims when it comes to stem cells. So based on what you said and the, the work that's been doing with the FDA, there's that it prompts a question that I keep hearing, which is scope, meaning that we know that stem cells can go in and regenerate and heal and identify even and know where to get to work. And the question that I get, which I don't know the answer to, is where is this going to apply? Are we talking about chronic diseases in general? Are we only talking about regenerating? So are we saying that we can then change the way we think about disease? Like let's regenerate tissue so that it's about the inflammation or the root causes as opposed to the disease itself. Where will it, where will it go? No, I think that's a great question. And unfortunately, not enough doctors who apply it are asking that particular question. Uh, they just see, see, see this as a, as a golden bullet and, and it's going to take care of everything when actually it's not. The best positioning of stem cells or regenerative medicine is, is in the sense of if we need to take immediate action, you know, if we need to get, you know, a fast track, you know, create some momentum in the healing process because it's an acute situation. Let's say, you know, you've got your, your shoulder injury, you got lots of inflammation, um, potentially a tear of any of the tendons. And so it's a good way to immediately address the problem. But the truth is, is that what we really need to focus on in addition to that or prior to that is really, you know, giving the all the resources of the body, what the body needs based on what you do. And that's the genetic blueprint, because otherwise it's just a guessing game and it's also only temporary. And so ideally in my world is that, you know, we do everything in advance. We give people the right types of foods, the right kinds of supplements and, and, and educate them on the right kind of lifestyles so that they ultimately don't need stem cells. But in a crisis, in an urgent situation, just like you know, acute care, stem cells has a very definitive uh, place. Yeah, and this goes back to the toolkit question because what you just laid out is what people need. It's not a response, it's a maintenance program that's right. uh, you know personalized for them, but that's not what's covered by insurance and that's not what's prescribed. And then and so you end up with these sort of jams but what we're what we're seeing at least and what i believe may happen is the cost of healthcare is such a burden now that the corporations that are footing the bill are going to drive change because it's it's bottom line now it's about well not only am i paying exorbitant healthcare costs to maintain an employee workforce but they're not healthy they're not productive you know, and, and that's the driving factor. I think that potentially could change things, but it's slow, but I think it, it could make move the needle a little bit. Well, when you look at the, the numbers in the 1960s, I think per capita cost was $146. Now it's 12,500. 
you know, that's right. more than an 8,000% increase. And also when you looked at the numbers as far as what it uh, costs for a person to earn the money back for that healthcare cost, I think it was 1958, it took them about 15 days uh, for them to pay off that particular cost of healthcare. Nowadays, it's about 60 days. So economically, it's, it's a, a major burden. What's making it worse is that predictions by 2030 is that, you know, we're going to have a shortage of doctors between 40 to 120,000 doctors. We now currently have 1 million. And, and besides that, the, the abilities of doctors to be able to perform at the highest level is, is dramatically changing nowadays for, for many different reasons, which I'm constantly talking about. And so we have to rethink how we do things. And, you know, you describe it very well in your, your videos, you know, $4 trillion in healthcare costs, 90% dealing with health, um, chronic disease, and 50% of the population has a chronic disease right now. That's insane. Yeah, it's truly insane. I don't know if there's any civilization that's ever, I mean, we're living longer for sure, right? But it's is it really life? Like you're, you're living just to pay right. health bills, you know? So in, in that journey do you think that 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 thing that you said where costs are more is that because disease is more rampant or is because is it because the costs are just going do we have better technology now that's just more expensive well there's another statistic i'll share with you so the united states spends twice as much or much more than any other country in healthcare uh costs and compared to 11 other western countries we actually come last and the quality of the health and our uh, efficacy in delivering health. So it goes to show that, you know, there's a, it's the, there's a multiple aspects of this problem, but it's predominantly, I mean, when we look at um, how the surgeons of um, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative conditions, um, you know, uh, obesity, diabetes, all these things, um, it's a result of lifestyle choices. So it's a combination of basically people are making the wrong lifestyle choices. But part of the problem is they just don't know any different. Yeah. It's, I think the concept of what is a raw, or even that being a priority has been removed from the culture. Like if you go to a country like Germany, for example, you know, in terms of where they're at, uh, economically and, you know, cultural wise, it, it matches Western, you know, what you see in the US everywhere except health, right? And if you look at where their misalignment is, the way they think about their food, the way they think about their families, you know, the way they think about how they work, it's all very different. There's some humanity to it, right? And there's that human touch, which we've lost. Uh, but there's also on the healthcare side, you go to countries like Germany and you see things in hospitals that are illegal in the U.S. Like there's, I've seen right. literally, uh, there's a, a concept called iridology where you can read the iris because you have all these um, right. uh, ends of in, in that end at the iris that connect the glands and different organs in your body that can tell you inflammatory levels, right? And you'll see in a hospital when somebody's unconscious, the iridologist will come and it's fully covered, paid for by health. Here, it's illegal, right? Right, because it's not evidence based. So right. the thinking is even different. The thinking of let's get to the root and why is this tumor there? Where is the inflammation starting? Why is it happening? So you have all these, it's the cultural aspect. It's the um, it, it, the sort of belief around healthcare itself. So that's a shift in how people think. And we're getting, I find the wave is getting more in the wrong direction than ever before. You know? I would have to agree. And you know the truth is, is that um, I'm very much into energy medicine. And right. whether it's human driven or technology driven, uh, but also the diagnostic aspect of it. And when we look in the 1800s, late 1800s, we had about 10,000 doctors using electricity on a daily basis for, uh, you know, in their practice to help heal. And then yeah. unfortunately, um, basically in 1906, with what's called the Flexner Report, you know, all the chiropractors and naturopaths and non MDs were kind of eliminated, including this electricity uh, technology, which actually Sears Roebuck was selling those devices. I mean, we right. all know Sears and you could buy them in the store. Oh, you're kidding. Um, and, uh, but nowadays in Germany, for example, or in Norway, there's a, a lot of research on energy medicine 
that seriously can have an impact on our, our well-being. And again, that's not allowed here in the United States. And so that's why, you know, I'm encouraged, you know, when people like yourself uh, are finding ways around that to support and with clinical evidence how it is that we can address our patients in a better way, no matter what discipline they come from, because ultimately that is one of the main starting points for optimizing our health. It's that yeah. genetic. I remember uh, we, we recently were involved in this bioenergetic summit where there was a bunch of interviews and we were one of the interviewees. Um, and I learned there that Tony Robbins actually flies around. He will not leave his home without his bioenergetic machine, which if he's in an airplane, it's on because of all the EMFs. You yep. know, when he lands in the hotel, it's on. And then he adjusts it per whatever the job is. Is it mood? Yep. Is it energy? Is it pre-gym, yep. post-gym? And he's yep. constantly using this thing and traveling with it, but it's just not, again, in the toolkit, but it's what's keeping him at, it, at his best, right? Yeah, I so, get on mine every morning, twice a day and, and in the morning and the evening. So how does it, how has it changed you? How do you feel different? You know, um, the best way I can describe it, I just actually started using the PMF beds, but um, I also, I work with a neuromuscular therapist and he noticed within a month that my tissues were much more pliable, much more supple um, mm. after using this, this device. And you actually sense it right away. And so um, I think long-term I'll, I'll notice a, a major difference. But um, my research currently, I'm, I'm doing a deep dive into energy medicine, and it's, it's astounding the amount of research and clinical evidence that's out there that will surely have a major impact on the future. And again, yeah. these are one of the things that I'm encouraging my colleagues to ultimately look at, uh, as well as everything else. So it's funny you mentioned PEMF, because um, I work a lot right? Which means I'm on a laptop and on my phone too much. And I had an old laptop, which I refused to change because I'm just like that. I was, you know, I just don't need to waste money on something that's unnecessary. Right. Uh, and what I found was my right hand was feeling off. It was somewhat numb, just uncomfortable. Then the tip of my right pointer finger was becoming calloused. Mm -hmm. And then it started happening here. And then it started getting to the discomfort level where it was very visceral, like I could feel it, right? And I, I, I was thinking, okay, so my, I put my phone away. I realized my my battery in my laptop was so old and emitting so much, and the, the mouse trackpad, which is where my right hand sat most of the day, moving things around, right. was causing this problem. So I called a gentleman who you may know, Dr. Pollock, who, who talks about uh, PMF quite a bit. And he sent me a device and I literally took a glove, stuck it in there, and put my hand through this thing for a weekend. And I'm not kidding. After the weekend, it was 80% gone. Wow. I then did this for a good month where every weekend, first of all, I got rid of my laptop. <laughs> I, I then did it every weekend. And it was, I still have a tiny bit of a callus on the tip of my finger here. But the, the all that feeling is gone. I can't even remember what it felt like. It's all gone. You know, so the truth of what's happening to us in terms, it's so the reason why I bring this up, because it's not also the energy medicine but it's also realizing the energy poison that we are around, right? right? It's the, the EMF poison that we are constantly being hit by the Wi-Fi in your home, all that stuff. So as much as energy can be medicine, the wrong version can be deadly. So I don't know how much of that you've seen in your clinical work. No, truthfully, I haven't seen that much because that wasn't, hasn't been my focus. Um, but here, here's one thing that, that is true. And, um, you know, we have a network of nerve cells and electricity goes through those cells and all of it creates a liquid magnetic field. And the, the heart pulsating, you know, uh, 60 times a minute is also emitting a electromagnetic field to all of your cells. And in fact, it's gonna radiate 12 feet outside of you. So that gives us pause to think, you know, mm -hmm. that our own heart is affecting every single cell in our body. And in fact, it's affecting people around us. And the truth is, is that you know, we all think we have five or six senses, perhaps we actually have 32 different senses, of which many of us, of many times we don't really are not really aware of it. But then again, there are other types of energies we are simply not aware of that are affecting our cells all the time. The cool thing about this, gosh, is this, is that, you know, rather than relying on pills and surgery to, you know, uh, rebalance our systems, 
you know, energy medicine of the future will absolutely be able to do it almost instantaneously, or in your case, like you discovered in just a matter of, of days or a week. So these 32 senses, I've never heard this before. Um, can you give us a couple of examples of things that we would Well, know? the senses that we're most familiar with, it's a heat sense, it's a pressure sense, it's a positional sense. But then we're also thinking about, you know, gamma waves that, you know, we can measure gamma waves and in some way or form, you know, our body is able to uh, recognize those. We're not aware of them, but simply, you know, because they exist, we have to assume as we've evolved over millions of years that our body is going to respond to these different types of energies. And, you know, when we talk about, um, you know, intuition, when we talk about premonition or whatever, really it's our ability to sense energies that we don't know how to articulate them right but they relate to our unconscious mind and the the response is actually um the field that we're talking about is the connective tissue you know everybody thinks that you know everything is is related to you know everything that happens in our body is related to chemical reactions and you know nerve cells well actually it's the connective tissue in of itself the how we communicate with the entire body and so again, I mean, these are new things that are coming out in, in our uh, scientific communities to really have an understanding as you know how our body works, basically also in the quantum field. So it's not just yeah. based on Newtonian physics, but in the quantum field and understanding how to tap into that is, is gonna be pretty remarkable. Yeah, and I, it's funny because we talk about these things as new it's more like it's like ancient wisdom that science is not validating, right? So Correct. we are now allowed to talk about it or allowed to use it or, you know, and products are allowed to be built on it. But they read ancient text. This has yep. been known for centuries, if not millennia, right? And it just, because it wasn't a pill, it in modern science was poo-pooed and like, this is not right. You know, none doesn't even exist. And we're starting to now see it as, it, just the, the, speaking of Nobel Prizes, the, the group that just won that Nobel Prize for quantum entanglement, right, who are now talking about it, just tried to, what, a couple months ago, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, something that we theoretically thought would have been a fairy tale, they just won a Nobel Prize for, which speaks a lot to what goes on in terms of energy and connection, where this concept of cell split, but they're still connected through the field. Yep. So what does that mean? That means, well, take that back. I came from my mother. Why does my mother have this intuition when I'm on the other side of the planet calling me and saying, do you feel okay? Right? Why did my uncle once call me saying that he dreamt that I needed his help? Truly, this actually happened on one of the worst days of my life. Right? Extreme stress. And he and he just, and I talked to him once every six months. Right? right? So that sense of quantum entanglement. And then what you learn, if you, if you start to understand that this is real, then there's a very different way you can heal yourself. Probably already have a sense of how invaluable a DNA 360 report can be. There's over two decades of research, 10,000 plus genomic samples, thousands of clinical consultations that we've learned from. The reports can identify things from chronic fatigue, dysregulated hormones, poor emotional resilience, addictions, weight gain, so much more as you've been listening. You discover your genomic insights from the DNA company through additional reports. We now have a longevity report that's live that will tell you how your body ages and how to optimize and slow that aging down. Go to the dnacompany.com today and check it out. Right, there's a very different way that not only you can heal yourself, but also should you even need to be sick in the first place? If you understand what your body is, how it's actually operating, what's actually going on and et cetera. That's a whole other conversation we can have, but you know, sure. certainly things people need to know. So then when we talk about energy, there's another piece of energy is also grounding, meaning if we're electrical beings. And I, right. I remember just recently reading an article about a gentleman who was being failed medically, uh, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and a few other issues. Uh, he was having mood and behavior issues also. And he literally, through some research he did, built a metal frame under his mattress, ran a cable out his window, out the door, hammered it into the ground and grounded while he slept himself well, while he slept sorry and he woke up after I, i'm not sure how long he did it but it was a, i think it was a few weeks and the actual empirical markers like the actual blood work and everything got better right 
right? So I'm not sure how the grounding pieces into energetic medicine, if it's all needed, one piece is needed, well, how do you even put all this together? Well, you know, again, um, if we talk about the term capacitance, where, you know, we hold in energy, especially when we're exposed to all this electromagnetic or electrical energy around us. And the problem then what happens with our cells, um, because cells are energy, uh, all molecules are energy. And so everything essentially is a vibration, a vibration of energy at a certain frequency. And what the studies out, out in Europe and in Russia have identified different frequencies with different cells, with different diseases, taking Lyme's, Lyme's disease, the Bordorella or Bordofri or Borgonella, I forget exactly how to say it, but oh, yeah. has a very specific frequency of 849 hertz, I think. And so that's why you can actually treat Lyme's disease with light therapy at a specific uh, frequency and just totally knock out that, that, um, those cells. And so it's the same thing with everything else, you know, with everything that's happening within our, in our system. Um, and especially when we have an imbalance, there's a disharmony of all the different frequencies that are happening. And so essentially what you're talking about by grounding, you're kind of unloading all this excess of energy and giving the, the body that opportunity to rebalance itself, find the normal, you know, resonating frequencies and then help the body heal. And so, you know, earthing as an example is, is definitely something that we all should do 30 minutes a day um, on natural soil or natural sand, really because again, I mean, it, it, it doesn't defy science. It doesn't defy logic, but we've evolved over millions of years. How? In perfect harmony with nature. And so all of the systems that are working within us have, have an intimate relationship with evolution over time. Mm. And so, ignore that just doesn't make sense and that's exactly what we've been doing for the last 200 years with you know thinking of all these things that make our lives so much more convenient are making it actually very much more inconvenient with uh, chronic disease and so the truth is is that the bodies are just simply overwhelmed overburdened um and again it's your toolkit like you're saying you know you get access to the right toolkit then you can basically restore, you know, your, your health. And we all know that sleep is so critically important. So if you're not sleeping well, you're not healing well either. Hmm. That's interesting. So when the, the thing you talked about there, if, um, so I'm grounded, I'm working on my energy, right? But then you mentioned a virus or a bacteria given Lyme has its own frequency which was right. measurable. We know what it is. How do you then I'm okay. I'm grounded. My energy has been set all that. Is that enough to deal with it? Or because it has a specific frequency, is there a specific thing I need to do to counter that frequency? How do I, what's the actual therapeutic? Like what, how do you so in, in, Yeah. In the, in the particular, well, in any kind of uh, illness, um, basically what's happening is that, you know, each of these different illness in illnesses or each of these different cells, essentially are vibrating at a very specific frequency and and so we can diagnose that and you talk about the diagnosis of the iridology system you know we have sound systems that do diagnostics we have photo emissions that we do diagnostic which is what i use which is the bio well where we measure photo emissions you know off of the fingers and then we can see all the different energy levels and the chakra levels and everything like that and so we don't have access to all this uh, sophisticated equipment, you know, that will make all these measurements, but there, these, that equipment is available in, in Europe. And in fact, that's what I'll be doing next year is, is being trained on those types of technologies. But my point is this, is that when a cell, for example, we know that it has a certain frequency, like in this case, the Lyme disease bacterium um, of 849 Hertz, any device, any energy device that can then sync with that frequency can technically um, eliminate that cell. And, and that's what we found. Um, so there's an opportunity to not have to rely on antibiotics or other kinds of medications to treat these things, but really optimizing the, the, um, the resonance, the energy, the frequency of cells. And that's actually what the PMF does as well. Because what the PMF system does, it, it um, upregulates 
the, the uh, frequency of our cells from up to about 70 to 100. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, it stabilizes the, the membrane and the ionic shifts that happen in the membrane, which when the cells are at a lower frequency because of all the toxins and everything else that, that, that's happening, it's going to allow that cell to function you know, in a normal way. And that's exactly what a PMS system will do, for example. And what they do with these systems, they dial in specific frequencies to help with, say, pain, to help with inflammation, uh, to help with immune disorders. I mean, there is a lot of science behind all this uh, that, you know, is re readily available in, in Europe. Hmm. That's, that's pretty cool. So I, I didn't think of it that way, right? Uh, I've understood that these... Um... I mean, everything has its own unique frequency and resonance, right? And, and I didn't think of it as targeting the frequency. You, you, the way we believe, the bacteria is a problem, the inflammation is a problem, the disease is a problem. If you can target its own existence to begin with, which is really frequency and wave, then you can literally just obliterate it, which is so awesome. Uh, yep. And and for people that are hearing this for the first time that think, wow, this is a little out there. This is conventional science. This is not new right this is not something not, that needs not to new at all this is known fact it, it's just it's just thinking about it from a different angle right how do you actually so if we know this is what how things work in physics how do we better utilize that what's a better solution and truly if you eliminate the frequency then you eliminate the bacteria itself so it, is the opposite also true that you know we live in a world of constant exposure to say music and sound so are we also surrounded by things that potentially absolutely. are making us sick that seem harmless? No, absolutely. In addition to that, it's also our own programming. So besides the actual energy that's being emitted, you know, it's also the programming that we have. And so, well, you know, for you, you may enjoy a certain type of music and another person doesn't, you know, that emotional connection that they have is going to trigger a certain frequency mentally as well as emotionally in the body that could have a, you know, a negative effect. But yes, everything is energy. You know, energy energy cannot be eliminated. It cannot dissipate. It just gets transferred or transformed to something else. And so, you know, if everything is energy and molecules, as you mentioned, are communicating with each other in, in a way that we never thought it's not just a chemical reaction, it's a, it's a, it's a quantum reaction, you know, so then everything is going to affect everything else. And so it's a matter of, you know, how much is influencing at any given moment. And in addition to, you know, what are you doing yourself? Mm. I remember uh, speaking to Dave once we met, we met earlier, we met at his conference, right? Dave Asprey. And I was talking about mitochondrial function and he kind of stopped me and he said, wait a second, you know, let's stop talking about the mitochondria as our battery or energy source. It's also our signaling system. Right. right. So it, it's how our cells are constantly in instantaneous communication, not only in, internally, but externally, meaning that that uh, safety net, you know, call it uh, alarm that's looking for problems. Um, so what you're talking about, do we know how this happens? Like the way that we know mitochondria is sort of sensing out what's going on. Uh, is, is it happening at the mitochondria? Is that where's that receptor or that antenna where? We're actually reading into frequency. Well, I guess the, the simple response to that is that um, everything has a, a, an antenna. And as we know, radio antennas, they send and they receive. So essentially all molecules you know, have that ability to send and receive. And so as we begin to think of things differently, we begin to think of our bodies not as a set of biochemical reactions, but more so in the quantum field and, and energy reactions and communication um, that happens instantaneously versus, you know, at the speed of sound or something, then we begin to recognize that, you know, we can no longer just look at, say, for example, the mitochondria as a organelle that is functioning on a biochemical level only. And so, yes, he's right. Um, absolutely. There is a, a, a type of energy that begins to be emitted. Um, it's communicated and in all directions. So they, the mitochondria will send and receive that kind of information. I, I guess the best way to look at it is this way, Kash, is that energy is a packet of information. 
And then we just have to process that information or the cells have to process that information in ways that we don't quite comprehend yet. And just like, you know, your experience, you know, with your uncle and your mom, you know, that's energy, that's information emitted in a way that we still have yet to really fully comprehend. Mm. And, you know, speaking of that example of my uncle, um, it reminds me of something that I was thinking about that maybe you may have insight into. It's kind of a combination of some of the things we're talking about. There's one thing to say that, um, you know, we can look at things at the frequency level, right? And understand the mechanics of how things even exist. And so then how to target them at the existence level, like your example of Lyme. Then there's also the example of the this quantum field that we're in, which again, these guys just won this Nobel Prize for putting this science out there. And it's been spoken about in quantum physics for some time, but now the research has evolved and it's sort of tangible in nature. So if you think of these thing, two things together, which is we're in a field, we're all connected, energy is a source. To me, that makes, th makes me think of remote healing. If, if we know the source, and we know it's energy and we know it's all connected in a field and the field has no concept of call it space or time. Everything is, is instantaneous right. and connected. Then is it true that meditate hard enough, think hard enough, believe hard enough, and you can remotely either deleteriously problematically cause a problem or actually support something and solve it. In theory, it seems to make sense based on all the, everything we're talking about. Well, they did a study in New York, actually, um, where they had a, in, a, in a community, 10% of the people were really focusing on meditating and totally affected the way that um, the rest of the, the environment was being affected. And I think the crime rate actually dropped. Um, I can't quote exactly what study that is, but, you know, I've, I've read that. And so essentially, when 10% of any group begins to be mindful, begins to meditate, it's going to affect the energy of the rest. And so, yeah, spontaneous healing is happening. Um, you know, the challenge that, that um, we have in today's world, and, and it's not nothing new. I mean, it's, it's centuries old, is that, you know, we're so used to a certain way of thinking and we only get it um, half right. And, and the other half, we only uh, we get it completely wrong. And so what happens then with that mindset, we've got something half right. We, 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 we really stick with thinking this is the only answer mm. and we are unwilling to see what else is actually possible. And I think in this new millennium, we have to begin to allow, you know, these, these ideas, these concepts of all these brilliant people in the past, you know, just to begin to examine, you know, what is actually possible? You know, what else can we discover? you know, that will help us, you know, you know, get those kinds of answers that we want and not simply rely on what we've been relying on is, is what Newtonian physics, which it relies on three things. It's, it's materialism, reductionism, and determinism, you know, trying to, you know, di um, distill everything to the smallest particle so that we can control it. Well, guess what? Quantum physics is not that. And again, I mean, there is so much and, and, uh, the challenge that we have is that as a human being, you know, we're also very driven by needing certainty and because we can supposedly rely on certainty. And in the medical profession, we rely a lot on certainty. And so I think that's oftentimes a challenge for uh, my colleagues out there to step out of those bounds. And that was my experience too. I mean, I, I knew energy medicine was there, but um, what helped me was all the science behind this. Mm -hmm. And so it's a lengthy, lengthy answer to your question. But the truth is, yes, I believe it's absolutely there. Um, and you just have to trust the, the process, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And that's the, the challenge. I mean, we're like, you know, when you go through training school, uh, having things done in the sort of evidence based model or the scientific model there's some efficacy but there's also some safety like there's two things we're kind of looking at right uh and the efficacy part i think uh is being blocked by the um safety part which isn't so safe anymore anyways right right 
Uh, and so I would just urge people to to go beyond and 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 learn and listen and not wait. You know, the, you, when I scroll online and I'm looking at articles, and I'll see an article in like Health Magazine or CNN that says new study shows that people need to sleep to be healthy. Right? And, and so if you're going to wait for that, if that's what you're waiting for for the study that that takes 30 years to figure out that yeah, if you sleep, you won't get cardiovascular disease. You know, it's or you can reach for valid science that just hasn't been through the process because the people that are doing it don't care if FDA agrees or not. Right. Uh, there's great stuff out there. And really, that's where the biohacking community thrives. Right. So and, and it's and it, for me, um, you know, this is no insult to my my colleagues, but I find it almost comical that you know all the latest you know, innovations have come outside of the medical field. And again, I think you 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 placed it or positioned it well, and and that is they've got the freedom to do things, um, and experiment and everything else. But if we go back in history, I mean, just the whole idea of washing your hands, you know, for when you treat patients, um, you know, that was established way back in the 1800s when a particular doctor said, look, you know, all these women are are getting sick, and there's a lot of these childbirths, you know, after you know delivery because you know people weren't washing their hands and he was absolutely totally ridiculed um right. and 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 you know found to um and later found to be correct but in the meantime you know he lost his reputation and i think he in fact you know, committed suicide because wow. he couldn't handle it and so this happens over and over again the same thing with vitamin c to treat scurvy I mean, right. there was a captain or a, a, a boat a ship cap a ship physician that discovered this and um and again ridiculed until many years later and you know so many lives could be um uh, saved and this is still happening today and it's the academic think tank that says no we we don't want this for whatever reasons um and i'm not going to go there for that but the truth is is that there are so many solutions out there and, and i think you're right you know we don't we have to recognize that you know something is out of balance you know, um, disease is basically a choice and I might be offending a lot of people with that, but I actually agree with you. Disease is a choice. And so it's a matter of, of exploring and experimenting in, a, in an intelligent way um, to optimize your health. Amazing. Well, this conversation has been amazing. Uh, I'm also really excited to work with you because, you know, the work we're going to do together is, I mean, you are a thought leader in the space and we're going to touch a lot of people and that's where it starts is working with like-minded people that are willing to work on tools that they may have to pay out of pocket for, but it's a lot better to pay a little bit now than to spend your life savings on some illness. That's, you know, literally just earlier, I was speaking to someone where I was reminded that 70% of your healthcare spend is usually in the last year of your life. Right. Right. And that's the thing that kills you, which was probably preventable, you know, as opposed to skydiving and forgetting to open your parachute, which is a much better way to go you know, in your nineties. So, um, yeah, so this is awesome. I'm, I'm really excited to, to work with you and, and bring this, uh, out there to people that think like you, uh, one step at a time. That's the only way we can do it. We got it. We're going to do it together. Well, I, I also want to commend you and your team and I've talked to many of them and I'm just really impressed. Um, you're, you're leading with the heart, which I think is so important these days. And, you know, the truth is, is that what you're offering is a roadmap, a roadmap for um, our, my colleagues and the consumer, the patient to understand, you know, what their choices can be, because that I found, you know, over the last 20 years, I've been struggling with, you know, what's, what's the real problem? And the real problem is that people don't have the information that they need, either what could potentially happen if they don't change, and then you know what is it that they can do to make that change and that's and then and then they're distracted with everything else that's happening and all the marketing and the promotions of food and lifestyle and and belonging and everything else such that you know there's no space to make that change and so what i love about what you're doing is you're actually really making that possible in such an easy way and you're creating the baseline the platform by which people can begin to make changes in their life that will certainly affect, you know, themselves, their future, their livelihood, their quality of life, and everything else that's, you know, around them. Thank you, Mark. That's very kind. 
Um, and we lead with the heart. The heart is just your second brain. You know, you have to decide right. which brain to use. Yeah, I, I remember speaking to Dr. Porter from Brain Tap, and he says we have three brains: the one in your head, your heart, and the one in your gut. Right, that's where your, your neurons sort of uh, independently operate, literally, truly, like brains. And I agree with you. We we th there's enough intelligence in this brain, you know, uh, where we don't need to be distracted by this one which is right. a little weird and, uh, and it makes us do amazing things. So this is awesome, Bart. Thank you for joining us. I can't Thank wait you. for everyone to listen and, and learn from you and uh, we'll connect again. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So much.